Nice job doing your homework there. <laughs> Holy cow. Look at you, <laughs> look at you showing up for the podcast. Okay. That's got like three listeners on it, and you're one of them. Um, <laughs> Patreon.com slash the walkoff podcast. Uh, $4 a month gets you in there. We are so darn excited to have returning to the show the head of the mental performance department for the Toronto Blue Jays, Robert D. Bernardo. Welcome back to the walkoff, man. Thanks so much for taking the time. Absolutely love it. Love the work that you both do. And Scott, Adam, looking forward to 30 minutes, uh, a chop up, chop it up session with both of you. Yeah, we're excited to have you back, man. I know you just got back from um, the player and staff leadership retreat. How was that? Uh, transformational, I'd say. Really? Yeah, yeah. We had uh, roughly four days, and we had an opportunity to do uh, combine two different types of programming. And uh, we went to Northwest Arkansas with uh, a new vendor. And this is a group of uh, former Rangers, some Marines that are working with veterans uh, on the civilian side of things, helping them find their purpose and helping them find uh, a way to serve uh, after post-deployment, post-military life. And we got to do all manner of things. And it was uh, it was incredible. Staff and players shoulder to shoulder, side by side, going through all kinds of activities. And we got a chance to get away from the usual day-to-day at our player development complex. And, uh, you know, it's always fun when you do that. Interesting. Yeah. Was was the all the players there or was it uh, kind of the more the players with the most leadership kind of put on their shoulders? How did this work? That's a great question. I mean, the selection process was one of players in the upper level of the system. So this is an opportunity for players that might have you know, impact in the near future and a chance to do a special programming to bring out some of those leadership qualities. Um, it was uh, you know, one of those things where we got the camp going a little on the later side in the sense that we hadn't done this programming for a couple of years uh, due to COVID. Mm-hmm. And so we had to go through a roster of guys and come up with I think ultimately we had 14 players in attendance and, and 11 staff. Wow. Amazing. Real, yeah, real nice, real nice. So I know last time we chatted, you gave an excellent breakdown of what the mental performance department was. And since that time, I'm going to brag a little to you here, Robert. Our listenership has grown by about 10 times. We actually finished number one on the Apple charts for baseball podcasts in <laughs> Canada. So uh for all of the new listeners out there, can you really quickly, before we kind of delve into the weeds here, explain what the mental performance department is? Okay, Scott, how to be essentially here. This is the elevator pitch stuff. Um, well, we've got a five-person team, and we are providing um, support, education, application, and support for you know, roughly 200 players in the system, but we work at a staff level as well. So not only players, but staff, all are considered high performance performers. In fact, I would put a plug in here for staff and coaches, knowing that they often come in earlier and leave later, uh, really high performers. And they're in that day-to-day environment with them living uh, the successes and struggles of the players in the development system. And then as they get to the big leagues. So the five of us will uh, quote unquote, divide and dominate uh, throughout the system. And, you know, our whole approach is to help develop the mindset of players uh, so that they can have the skills that stand up under pressure. Um, The kind of skills that when they move through the levels, uh, it travels and they can deliver what they do on a nightly basis. And there can be real challenges with that. Obviously, uh, there are internal, internal barriers. Sometimes players doubt themselves, unsure if they belong, and they need proof of concept as they have some success on the field. You know, and then externally, uh, there are all types of things that go on. You put an extra comma in the paycheck. uh, You get an extra deck on a stadium. You have agents and business managers and all manner of people that are part of your inner circle. Uh, There's a lot on the plate. And so, you know, what are the things we can do from a mindset standpoint to put a player or a staff member in the best possible position to be able to deliver nightly? And the one thing I've learned about baseball is a healthy respect for 162 games 
that players stay in a competitive space for months at a time and nightly, and just the sheer volume of competition and what that means to show up day after day. Uh, oftentimes when you may not be feeling your best and you're really gonna need to bring uh, that elite attitude and that elite focus to what you do so you can still perform. That's such a great point about the grind of 162 because it's not just physical. The mental grind of 162 games, like I can't even imagine being mentally prepared to go night in and night out. Yeah, it's really, really challenging. It's not uh, it's not easy to have your best fastball every single night. <laughs> um, there's a Roger Clemens story, I, I, you know, where he probably had his best uh, 50% of the time, possibly less, but he still had to get major league hitters out. And so that's where really the strategy and the mental fortitude come in to be able to find ways without your ace stuff. And the two of you, I, I know that you do comedy. And if you're on that grind of being on the road and doing show after show to bring the funny night after night, mm -hmm. uh, not, not easy to do. Whether you're feeling funny or not. Nope, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Robert, I'd love to hear about the department's approach as we have watched so many new members to this Toronto Blue Jays team enter the organization. How do you go about kind of integrating them into the Blue Jays system? I love this question on a lot of levels. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things being in baseball and in any industry, Scott's going to have attrition, um, any industry, but you may argue that baseball has more roster churn and attrition than some other industries. And so you have some people staying, some people going, uh, and some people coming in. And so any organization wants to figure out how to do this well. How do you integrate new people, new talent into the org so they can shine right away? So maybe those learning curves and those trust curves, uh, they're shortened uh, and people can really deliver what they do. I would argue that onboarding happens before that person even arrives, uh, first touch point, be it Zoom or phone call, or even arrives in the building. I think, you know, and this isn't party line for me, the leadership here is just extraordinary. I feel very lucky to be a Blue Jay. There's a, a shared mission and one that we don't shy away from, which is sustainable world champ championships to Canada. And mm -hmm. that national peace matters. There are shared values that we have. I think on the last show, we talked about it, collaborate, learn, empower, achieve, yes. and respect. And you know those things breathe with the people in the building. You can put them on walls, but they have to live and breathe by the way people embody those things. The next piece is the world-class facilities we have. We have a player development complex now that you can say is world-class. The renovations to the Rogers Center, you could say, are making that an extremely desirable place to play and a landing spot for major leaguers that want to play in Canada and be part of that. These are all to say that these things help on board in that it attracts top talent. People want to be part of a values-based organization that knows where the hell they're going. They've got mm -hmm. a mission. People want to be part of world-class facilities for development and for playing and, and say, yeah, best in class. Who wouldn't want to be part of that? Once you go beyond that, I think the kind of touch points that you have, our, our department, the MP department, had a team read last year, which was Belonging by Owen Eastwood. And in that book, he spent some time, among other things, talking about how culture and environment really can shape the individual and how they behave and move through space. And so these early touch points are so vital. And I think people want to know that beyond just their subject matter expertise or their talent, this is for staff or for players, they're getting belonging cues that it's okay to be you, that it's okay to shine, that there are things in the environment that suggest that they are enough and we're going to put you in every possible position to succeed and find that balance between self-expression and the Blue Jays way. In the book, they use this uh, 
uh, Maori, um, I think it's quote, a way of thinking of it, which is Tapu and Noah, or Noah and Ta Tapu and Noah, which is Tapu, I believe, are the non-negotiables. This is what we do, this is who we are. And then the Noah is, this is who you are and your self-expression, and how can the two of them find balance in this environment? The metaphor that they use for this is one that gets me pretty excited. The two of you may eye roll it. I'm not sure, but I'm going to go for it. But it's uh, streams into a river. And the idea is your personal meanings and who you are feeds into that river, that larger mission that we have. And that you're going to be seen and have the ability to express, but we're all moving in the same direction. I love that okay. analogy. We love a good analogy here, but they're rarely as well put as that. <laughs> um, let's take a, a quick left turn here because I'm curious what the approach was for your department after that devastating collapse in game two of the wild card. I felt like the fan base pretty much needed a mental performance <laughs> department after that one. How do you turn such a disappointment into a learning opportunity and, and a, a chance to move the organization forward? Yeah, it's a good one. And I imagine there are people, you know, listening to this uh, and wrapping their heads around that and and knowing that that you know we'll have some historical context too as they look at the blue jays over over the decades you know uh truth be told in the moment a gut punch um you know you care so much about players care so much about staff and the relationships are real and intimate here and so to see the team uh you know not succeed uh on that particular night it hurts um, but I believe these moments are inflection points. Uh, these are moments where people will figure out what their explanatory style is, what went wrong, how can we get better? And you know, from an MP department, we always focus on the controllables, which are uh, looking internally. What can we do? There's a cliche, uh, and the cliche is it's, it's winning and learning, not winning and losing. And that's an industry cliche in sports psychology, but I think it's a truism. I think it's only failure if you believe it to be failure and interpret it as such as a defining moment where it didn't work out that's going to have long lasting impacts. However, I view it, our department would view it as just a data point. It's a data point in this team's journey, in this team's story. You have a real, a core group returning. And what are the things that we need to know and learn from that experience? What are some of the external solutions that would address the needs that we have? And what are the internal solutions for the players that are returning to be better and to realize the margins are often very small between winning and losing? Yeah, isn't that the truth? <laughs> it's just like microscopic. Mm. Uh, sports is such a copycat industry. Whenever something's working, everyone seems to get on board. So I am curious, how much do you kind of look at what other organizations are doing? And, and when something is working, think to yourself, could we use this here? Uh, and do you have any examples of that? Oh, that's really good. That's really good. And I think, you know, any good practitioner uh, is, is going to look around and see what best practices are or industry uh, standards are. Uh, I think it's really, really important to have cross collaboration, collegiality. However, I do think within that, it's really important to have a real core identity of the things that you do and you do well, and you know that you can crush. I think it would be foolish knowing the pace of progress uh, on a number of fronts. Uh, in our world, there's biofeedback, there's neuroscience, there are a number of things of virtual reality and VR caves and all kinds of toys and different things that are out there. So um, we try to stay true to a lot of the things that we do, but we also try to do workshops and quote unquote upskill on certain things. So for instance, an example of that would be, you know, a, a breath work. Our group, uh, our whole team uh, did workshops in the off season to understand what uh, breathing patterns and proper breathing technique can actually mean for nervous system regulation. 
it turns out that you, when you put certain players in these highly charged competitive environments night after night, that nervous system is lit up like a Christmas tree. And is that sustainable long-term or are there ways to figure out how to downregulate a nerf, nervous system, how to upregulate a nervous system for a player that may be tired or experiencing fatigue, but is in the lineup and still needs to be really, really sharp. So we saw breath work as something we could upskill on. And, uh, you know, it turns out there's a, a long history of that out there. And that's something that we've been working with players for a while. Is the breath work, is that something that would happen in the clubhouse before the game? Is this something that happens uh, in the on-deck circle or in the batter's box? Like, At what point does this breath work get implemented on game day? That's, that's, man, that's such a, it's such a really, really good question because, you know, obviously players have their prepare, compete, and recover within the Blue Jays. And during that preparation time, there is downtime for us to build out a breathing practice with guys. One, self-awareness, what are my patterns and where do I hold my breath? And then two, how do I find ways to access it, get a little bit more centered and grounded in what I'm doing? But how is that portable and all-terrain? How do you take that into performance when it goes sideways, when I need it most? when I'm on the mound and the umpire is squeezing the strike zone and I know I'm bringing it and I'm pissed. <laughs> yeah. And now I don't know what a strike is. Um, yes. Being able to bring that in between pitches, knowing there's a pitch clock now that has reduced that time. What used to be 15 seconds and we had, you know, our, our win the 15 program. So between pitches, what are the things you can do to get your mind right and bring full intent to everything you're doing? That's going to be intent. my next question. And so to be really, really purposeful with your movements, that's difficult to do in a game that has so much discontinuous action. So now we've got a shortened pitch clock and we're trying to find ways to take these practices and make them portable to the field. So when a guy's in a neck on deck circle, they're working as they're walking to the batter's box, they're able to use it. And then when they're in the batter's box, it's full send go time. But if it does go sideways, if I've lost my approach or I've seen something I didn't expect, or I had a really, really weak swing on a ball and I've somehow gotten out of my plan, I will find ways to work one full in -ex inhale and exhale uh, to my technique to get me back to baseline as much as possible. And is that breath work, is that more uh, like a mental impact or does that have like a physiological effect as well? Well, I think there's both. I think, you know, there's a, we start with a physiological, I think what, players enjoy breath work so much, especially certain styles that are very, very active, it's accessible for them. And you also reap immediate physical benefits. Um, there's certain techniques out there that you can immediately feel uh, differences in your body. It's happening at a somatic level. And there's research to show, you know, what that can do with certain types of breathing where you're emphasizing the exhale, which will engage a parasympathetic response which allows the body to relax. It allows the body to deal with maybe perceived stressors that are too much for the athlete. Um, conversely, a little bit of hyperventilation, hyperoxygenation is gonna create some alertness of mind and you're gonna feel some tingliness and you're gonna feel some uh, acuity and alertness around what you're doing. And those things can be really helpful uh, beyond you know, caffeine or some other things that a player may do to, to, to get those states of mind. Um, but how you interpret those signals on the mental side are absolutely vital. Um, if you're perceiving, you know, those body signals in a really, really good way as a sweet spot, um, that's going to allow the mind to really lock in on plan. Uh, players often that get stressed or are experiencing what might be anxiety can go really narrow and internal. And it turns out that's not great for seeing Velo at 98 coming out of the pitcher's hand. If you can get that focus narrow and external and really locked in on your plan, that's going to help a lot. I just love the psychology behind this because, and, and you summed it up so well with the, the streams into the river analogy, because when it comes to sports, it is such a team first mentality. And it's incredibly important to have that, 
cohesive goal and everyone be on board. But like you just said, it is so individualized too. And it's so important for the players to understand when stuff like these breathing exercises work for them. And I know communication is so important. I know we talked to you about this last time and just how, uh, is it group? Is it one-on-one? And you were basically like, it's both. And it's important to kind of, uh, tunnel in on, on who the individual is and, and what they're doing. I know you mentioned your five staff members. I would love to hear, show a little love there. Let's hear their names and their roles and, and what they do and, and how they have, uh, really made this mental performance department work for you. Scott, you're the man. I really appreciate teeing me up to be able to talk about the team because I, I, I'm really, really fortunate. Um, you've had him on the show before, but mm-hmm. Jimmy Van Ostrin is our major league mental performance coach. For um, those listening, by the way, he's going to be the bearded guy you see in the <laughs> dugout all the time. <laughs> And the beard is luscious right now. Uh, <laughs> Good to hear. <laughs> it'll be hard to miss. We'll see how long he keeps that. But um, I, he's had vast playing experience, playing for Team Canada, playing minor league baseball uh, for a long time. He's a world-traveled guy and cultured. And he's also coached in the NCAA environment for a long time, and then has been a mental performance coach with the Mariners and has been doing this for years and has some great mentors. When one of the things that blows me away about him is perspective, Um, he's a rock. And so much of his work, if you observed it, he's just creating a space for development and he's such a keen observer and he's so judicious with his feedback. You know, at that level, you have guys that have had stuff is working for many of them. They've had long careers. And so he really picks his spots and he's shaping and refining. Um, And his perspective is just elite and he's a rock. Um, He models a lot of that self-regulation, self-management in these high uh, competitive environments, high stress environments. He really manages himself so well. And then he's able to give that to other people in the environment. Uh, Which is a skill set on its own, isn't it? Being able to impart that wisdom. 100%. You know, I think uh, timing is everything. When a student is ready, a teacher will arrive. And so Jimmy's not going to hit you with a ton of stuff. But when you have an ask, he will be ready and he will offer and deliver something that's a nugget. Um, And there's something to be said for that. Um, uh, 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 a less is more rather than more and more approach and, and, you know, not trying to demonstrate value. He can hold his space in the environment until the moment is right. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing. Um, elite in my mind. Uh, we have another team member, John Lennon, former major league pitcher, uh, a long career and a really, really established lefty and, uh, John is a deep swimmer. He's got clinical chops. He's got met a performance psychology chops. He's been with the team now going on year four, and he's got the ability to work with all manner of players. He has the ability to set culture. Um, he has the ability to work with players that may be going through uh, tougher challenges and uh, trust him. And He's just, and he can also throw lefty BP with good mix. <laughs> well, there's that. <laughs> Which is like, right? Swiss Army knife. I, I don't know if it gets better. <laughs> okay. You are always do, so generous. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I do want to hit up the other two. We have two, yes. two new members to the team, Scott. And, and, you know, one of the things we wanted to do was, uh, enhance our Latin American players support, you know, not just uh, um, having bilingual capabilities, but also bicultural understanding. What does it mean to come uh, to be an international signee or an international player and then come stateside and enter a really complex player development system that's got seven teams, all new coaches, a different language, different culture. And so we hired Raul Pimentel, um, and Erica Monsalve, and, and both of them in their first year, things that we emphasize are feel and relationships first before we start trying to deliver content and be subject matter experts. 
We want people to know that we care, we can be trusted, and we want to learn you. And our whole stance is you're the expert on you and we'll help guide, facilitate, uh, and bring those answers out of you and those solutions out of you because you already have a lot of things to get to this level to recommend you. Love it. What a great team. I uh, thank you for for shining some light on them. It is appreciated. And honestly, Robert, we appreciate you so much and your generosity with your time. We are well aware you do not need to sit sit down with a couple of boneheads with a little podcast in Alberta, but we really do appreciate it. We've got a couple of listener questions we're going to try to get to before we let you go. But again, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, first one comes in from Jolting Z wants to know for D Bernardo, when a player is in both a physical and mental funk in the sport, in every aspect of the game, what amount of work on your end do you have to do slash provide to help them get out of it? Mm. Oh, that's so good. So good. And uh, by the way, over six months, and when you're going from April into September, it's likely there's there's going to be a few weeks in there where maybe a, a player feels like they're, <laughs> they're giving away some ABs, um, that many of the wounds can be self-inflicted, and it's not pitchers getting them out, but it's themselves getting them out, and there's this perceived slump, so to speak. Uh, we try to normalize that. Uh, I, I don't necessarily use the word slump. Uh, it, it's actually part of it. It's very difficult to sustain high level performance through that. So physically, mentally, things are going on for the player. I do think it's very important to hear from players, um, you know, what they perceive is going on. I think it's very important to hear from coaches what they may perceive because you've got, by the way, we've got technical and tactical experts and professors of practice surrounding us. Mm -hmm. So to get a 360 view of what may be at issue, information is power to figure out where that leverage point is. Often ask a player, stop, start, continue. In your mind, is there anything that needs to be stopped based on what's going on? Is there anything that you may need to start? Because sometimes players start to tinker and want to change at the first sign of struggle. And then we ask, is there anything you want to continue? Meaning, is there a sustain here? In this moment, are you doing the right things? And is it a stay the course moment? And you trust your work and trust yourself. Now, sometimes there are hitting and pitching adjustments that are needed and we'll consult the experts and then we work through the change that goes with that and change in the middle of the season is difficult. It is difficult when you've got a person focusing on technique while trying to compete with a dude that's trying to hit it 110 back up the box. <laughs> that's going to be yeah. real scary. Um, but a lot of times, Adam, that could be a matter of sustain and stay the course, which is not always what players want to hear when something is perceived to go sideways. One of the hardest things to do for a player is to trust their work and to trust themselves in a variety of situations. If it turns out that the player is feeling stop and start in a major way and the coaches around them are saying the same thing, chances are tweaks need to be made and support for those tweaks in the cage, throwing sides, working through the mindset to approach that have to happen. But there's a large percent of the percentage of the time that it could be a sustain and it's a matter of trusting your preparation and bringing great purpose and not getting too hitched to outcomes right away. Awesome, okay. Well, this, I this got one, be... sorry, go ahead, Scott. <laughs> I was going to wrap it up here. We're I got one last minutes. one. I, I got to okay. I got to steal in here. So Come last one, I, I listened to uh, you were on the Sauce Talk podcast, and I was listening to that before we uh, sat down today. And there was a, a conversation about being the man, being a high status individual on a team, mm -hmm. and the struggles that one can go with uh, in a new role when they are no longer the man. Right? Uh, maybe a, a highly touted uh, draft pick who has mm -hmm. had a longer road to the, to the show than was initially anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, baseball aside, what's and quickly here, but what's one piece of advice you could give anyone listening to this, who's going through that in their life right now, 
And then also for anybody who maybe has a loved one going through it, how they could support, you know, their son, their daughter, their spouse uh, as they go through it. That's really good. First of all, nice job doing your homework there. <laughs> Holy cow. Look at you, <laughs> look at you showing up for the podcast. Okay. That's got like three listeners on it and you're one of them. Um, well done. Uh, and be, keep it short is uh, obviously, you know, that's a challenge for me, but um, <laughs> yeah, losing face or losing status is really, really, uh, boy, does it create crises of confidence for folks. You know, when you come from a circumstance where you are the man of your high status and you enter a new circumstance where now maybe you're starting at zero or you're really feeling this desire to prove yourself, um, ooh, that is tough. You're living and dying with results. You know, one of the ways we like to flip it is it's not so much proving, but improving. How can you flip that about your own growth and development and not get so wrapped up in the results to show you belong? Um, and I think really, really getting crystal clear on what your plan is and then uh, being able to come get that work every day. I mean, come get the work every day. Um, and there's some peace in the preparation um, and there's some peace in acknowledging in incremental growth in your new circumstance, being able to celebrate those small wins. You know, what was success in a prior environment that allowed you to be a high status individual all of us go to different environments where we may feel uh, less sure of ourselves. And so a plan, celebrating wins, having an elite support system. And I think the biggest one for us is, uh, you know, you're more than just a baseball player. When someone is totally invested in just baseball, it's burn the boats, this is all I am, and their self-worth is wrapped up in at-bats and ERA and performance metrics, Boy, is that going to be a bumpy ride. But if you're a, a father, a son, a brother, a husband, a friend, if you've got other things to ground you in your life, you're really able to keep those things in perspective and take a day-by-day -day approach, whether you're high status or low status. Such a thoughtful answer. Really Thank appreciate so that. That's great. Yeah. Uh, we won't keep you any longer here. We know you had a, a tight 30 here, so we really, really appreciate you taking the time. We're rooting for you in 2023. Thanks again, Robert. Appreciate it. Scott, Adam, a joy to be on the show, and, and let's go, Jays. 2023, here we go.